ನಮೋ ಧಸ ಭಗವಥೋ ಅರ್ಹತೋ ಸಂ ಸಂಬುಧಸ ನಮೋ ಧಸ ಭಗವಥೋ ಅರ್ಹತೋ ಸಂ ಸಂಬುಧಸ ನಮೋ ಧಸ ಭಗವಥೋ ಅರ್ಹತೋ ಸಂ ಸಂಬುಧಸ ಉಧಂ ಸರಣ ಗಾಚಾಮಿ ಧಮ್ಮ ಸರಣ ಗಾಚಾಮಿ ಸಂಘಂ ಸರಣ ಗಾಚಾಮಿ ದುಧಯ ಬಿಬುಧ ಸರಣ ಗಾಚಾಮಿ ದುಧಯ ಬಿಧಮ್ಮ ಸರಣ ಗಾಚಾಮಿ ದುಧಯ ಬಿ ಸಂಘಂ ಸರಣ ಗಾಚಾಮಿ ತಥಯ ಬಿಬುಧ ಸರಣ ಗಾಚಾಮಿ ತಥಯ ಬಿಧಮ್ಮ ಸರಣ ಗಾಚಾಮಿ ತಥಯ ಬಿ ಸಂಘಂ ಸರಣ ಗಾಚಾಮಿ ನಮೋ ಬುಧಯ ನಮೋ ಧರ್ಮಯ್ಯ ನಮೋ ಸಂಘಯ್ಯ ನಮೋ ಬುಧಯ್ಯ ನಮೋ ಧರ್ಮಯ್ಯ ನಮೋ ಸಂಘಯ್ಯ ನಮೋ ಬುಧಯ್ಯ ನಮೋ ಧರ್ಮಯ್ಯ ನಮೋ ಸಂಘಯ್ಯ ಐ ಟೇಕ್ ರೆಫ್ಯೂಜ್ ಅಂಟಿಲ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಇನ್ ಲೈಟೆಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಬುಧ ದ ಧರ್ಮ ಅಂಡ್ ದ ಸಂಘ ಥ್ರೂ ದ ಪಾಸಿಟಿವ್ ಪೊಟೆನ್ಷಿಯಲ್ ಐ ಕ್ರಿಯೇಟ್ ಬೈ ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟಿಸಿಂಗ್ ದ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಪಾರಾಮೀಟರ್ಸ್ ಮೇ ಐ ಸೂನ್ ಅಟೈನ್ ಇನ್ ಲೈಟೆಂಡ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಇನ್ ಆರ್ಡರ್ ಟು ಬೆನಿಫಿಟ್ ಆಲ್ ಸೆಂಟಿಯನ್ ಬಿ I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by practicing the six parameters, may I soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by practicing the six parameters, May I soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and its causes. May they be free from suffering and its causes. May they never be parted from their happiness beyond suffering. May they abide in equanimity free of bias, attachment to the near and aversion from the far. I shall cause this. Great compassionate Buddha, please inspire me to be able to do so. Reverently I prostrate with my body speech in mind and present clouds of every types of offerings actual and mentally transformed I confess all of my negative actions accumulated since beginning was time and rejoice in all the virtues of all holy and ordinary beings please remain until cyclic existence ends and turn the wheel of dharma for all sentient beings I dedicate the virtues of myself and others to the great enlightenment However innumerable all sentient beings are ever to save them all however inexhaustible my delusions are ever to extinguish them all however immeasurable the dharma teachings are ever to master them all however endless the buddha's way is ever to follow it completely om mani padme hum om mani padme hum Om Mani Padme Hum Tayata Hum Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhi Soha Tayata Hum Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhi Soha Tayata Hum Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhi Soha So now get yourself into a very comfortable position whether you're sitting down on the floor cross-legged or on a cushion or a chair or a couch or lying down bring your mind to your body that will start at the feet the goal here is to release tension from the body which in turn will help us to release the tension from our mind So release the tension from the tips of your toes the balls of your feet and the arches and the heels the top of your feet 
and around your ankles and Achilles tendons. Now release the tension from your lower leg, from the calf muscles and the shin areas. In the front sides and back of your knees. Your upper leg, the quad muscles at the front and the hamstrings at the back. Your midsection, the glutes, the hip flexors and the groin. Now bring your focus to your lower stomach, your hips and just above your hips and your lower back and release whatever tension may be there. From further up your stomach and your sides and to the center of your back. your chest area, underneath your arms and your upper back. Release the tension from your lateral muscles and from your rhomboid muscles that run between the shoulder blades and the spine on either side. Now bring your focus to release the tension from your upper trap muscles that run between your neck and shoulders as well as your shoulders. Your upper arms, biceps and triceps, elbows, forearms, wrists, hands, fingers and thumbs. Now bring your focus up to your neck and release the tension from the front, sides and back of your neck, as well as up the back of your head. the sides of your head, around your ears and your temples. And now release the tension from your face, from around your cheekbones and cheeks. Make sure you're not clenching your jaw, your chin and mouth, both inside and outside. Resting your tongue on the upper palate, just above the top teeth and gently touching your lips. Release from your nose and sinuses and eye sockets and eyes. And make sure you're not frowning on your forehead. And finally release from the crown of your head. And now briefly scan your body from the tips of your toes to the tips of your fingers and to the top of your head to release any leftover tension you may have. Now bring your focus to your breath, initially the tip of your nose and follow the feeling of the breath as you breathe in and out. Breathing in, the air is quite cool on the back of your throat. And as it enters the lungs, they expand. As you breathe out, they compress and the air is quite warm as it passes your throat on the way out your nose. That's all you have to do right now what you did earlier today or yesterday, or what you will do into the future. Just let it be, let it go for the moment and focus on your breath. Be kind to yourself and calm your mind. Breathing in, breathing out. You may notice a calm feeling Notice that feeling, then let it be, let it go. Be happy with it, be happy with yourself. If thoughts arise, don't cling to them, don't grasp at them, don't deny them and don't try to forcefully push them away. Just let them come and go naturally by refocusing on your breath. And likewise with feelings and emotions, If your mind becomes a little bit dull, focus more brightly on your breath. This way, 
Focusing or refocusing or replacing your mind onto your breath is the antidote for both the agitated and worried mind as well as the dull and sleepy mind. And now we'll do this for a few minutes in silence. Don't try too hard, don't try too little. Don't be hard on yourself. If your mind wanders, that's okay. Just bring it back to the breath. So now you can feel very pleased with yourself for giving yourself the opportunity to calm and brighten your mind, as well as get to know your mind more. As we get to know the mind more, we get to know what to adopt or to increase the good qualities that we should nurture and increase, eventually perfect, as well as the faults that we can decrease, eventually eradicate. It's like peeling away the outer petals of the lotus flower. Or sometimes we use the example of an onion, which is a good, a good example as well, because it's difficult to peel an onion, to get away all of the outer layers. I find myself crying when I do it, if ever I do it. Fill yourself with universal loving kindness, friendship, respect and appreciation, forgiveness and acceptance, and truthfulness. Really have the feeling 
of you, you being loving and kind to yourself. You are yourself's best friend. Now with this feeling of loving kindness radiated outwards, first of all to your family and friends, and loved ones, wishing that they have happiness and the causes of happiness, and that they are free from suffering and the causes of suffering. That they have peace. Now extend it out further to those you may regard as strangers, those people you may know a little bit or not at all. May they also have peace and be happy and free from unhappiness. Now extend this loving kindness out even further to include those you find difficult or may regard as enemies. May all people have happiness and the causes of happiness and may they be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they be calm and peaceful. Now, just like a tidal wave of loving kindness extended out further and further to include all living beings, first of all, around your area, all living beings that are born from wombs, from eggs, from moisture, through transformation. Those that live on the land and under the land and in the waters, the oceans, the rivers, the lakes, as well as fly through the air. May all living beings have happiness and be free from suffering and be at peace. Extend it out further and further to include your state or county. Further and further to include your whole country. May peace and love and kindness pervade everywhere. And further and further to other countries that you may be familiar with or have friends at, or even have studied in books on the computer. Extend this love and kindness to all of these places and now to all of the places you're unfamiliar with and maybe don't even know about until loving kindness and peace pervade the whole world. May there be peace everywhere. May there be loving kindness everywhere. Now extend and radiate this love and kindness beyond just this world throughout the whole solar system. Beyond this solar system throughout the whole galaxy that we call the Milky Way. And throughout all of the galaxies within this universe until this loving kindness and peace pervades the whole universe. And now extend the loving kindness throughout infinite space, this infinite loving kindness, immeasurable loving kindness, pervading everywhere, what we say in the 10 directions, that's the cardinal directions, the ones in between and above and below. Now come back to be present with yourself and we will recite the dedication prayer. Due to this merit, may I soon attain the enlightened state of the Buddha so that I may be able to liberate all sentient beings from their sufferings. May the precious bodhicitta not yet born arise and grow. May that born have no decline but increase forevermore. And may the precious view of shunyata not yet born arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. So now we can have the Dharma talk. Just um, if there's anybody that hasn't joined us before, uh, we're talking about the Eightfold Path. 
um, which is the fourth of the noble truths. The first noble truth being the truth of unsatisfactoriness, or quite commonly known as the truth of suffering. Then we have the truth of the origin or the cause of suffering. And the third noble truth is enlightenment itself, the cessation of the cause of suffering. And how to do that, this is what we're talking about, which is the noble eightfold path of right understanding, right intentions and thoughts, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration. We've already spoken about the foundation of this and moral morality, which is one of what we call, or the, the Buddha called the three higher trainings, which is another way to express the Eightfold Path. So we spoke about right speech, we spoke about right action, we spoke about right livelihood. And basically it means to engage in speech, actions and livelihood that is harmless. Avoid harming yourself and others and all of nature. And to, be, to live in a beneficial way. Beneficial to train to help train your mind as well as beneficial for others and the whole of nature Last week we spoke about the right effort or right enthusiastic perseverance Which is the effort the great effort to if um, wholesome thoughts have arisen in your mind to keep them nurture them perfect them if wholesome thoughts have not arisen in your mind adopt them and do likewise if unwholesome thoughts have arisen in your mind, eradicate them, get rid of them. And if unwholesome thoughts have not arisen in your mind, then protect your mind from them arising. So today we're talking about mindfulness, which is a common word in the world today. The Pali and Sanskrit word is sati. Like for instance, we um, just practiced anapanasati before the loving kindness meditation. Anapana means the breathing process or, or the breath. Sati, mindfulness, the so mindfulness of the breath. Basically, what we're going to talk about today is, is based on what we call the Satipatthana Sutras. So the Satipatthana means the foundations of mindfulness. There is a short, a shorter version of the Satipatthana Sutra, and there's also a longer version. So if you, you yourself feel inclined to study further the actual words of the Buddha, then I'm sure that you can access these sutras quite easily online uh, at BuddhaNet, I think. Um, I think that's, that's what it's called. So, and other websites as well. Then, um, so we'll talk about it in detail. I'd like to talk about it in sense of med the meditation practice but also um, in everyday life out, out there while you're active, what I like to call the practice on the cushion and the practice off the cushion. We practice on the cushion to be able to practice off the cushion. And as we practice off the cushion, this helps our practice on the cushion. Hopefully you know what I mean by that. It's the sitting meditation, this is on the cushion. And when you're active in the community and outside, and even doing your housework and gardening and things like that, this is like off the cushion. Once again, we need to be harmless. We need to be of benefit. We need to do our best to maintain a wholesome state of mind that is conducive to peace and happiness and to avoid an unwholesome state of mind and therefore avoid being unhappy and experiencing the suffering and having a lack of peace. So the four foundations of mindfulness, first of all, to do with the meditation practice on the cushion, is they are in short form, a form or our physicality, feelings or sensations, mind and the activities of the mind or the objects of the mind mental activities. So when we're sitting and focusing on our breath, we're sitting with our body. We have our posture, we have the whole of our body. Quite often we call this our temple. 
You'll be mindful of this. But also the breath is a physical thing. So we are focusing on the breath and therefore we're engaging in the focus or mindfulness of the first aspect, the first foundation, which is the body, physicality. As we progress through our practice, we can also become aware of what the body is. It's transient nature, it's empty nature. Then also we have mental feelings or mental sensations. You can be aware of this in your practice. As I mentioned, you may become aware of a feeling of calmness or brightness or of peace. Or conversely, difficulties. You may have some sort of irritation, either in your body or your mind. You'd be aware of it and you let it go by refocusing onto the breath, the object. The third foundation of mindfulness is mind itself. Bringing your focus into your mind, deeper and deeper into your mind. We are aware of our breath or we are mindful of our breath. Our feelings as we breathe in and out. Remember that the three types of feelings only really, or sensations, there's pleasurable or pleasant, unpleasant and neutral. And going deeper into the mind, actually it's, we, we say the feeling of the breath, but it's really kind of like a mental image of the breath, isn't it? And then we have mental activities, the mind going from thought to thought, from sensation to sensation. We're doing our best to not cling to that or them, not grasp at them, not try to forcefully push them away and not to deny them. The more we do this, the better we get at it, the more it becomes natural to do so. The more we rejoice then, and the more enthusiastic we are with our practice. Now outside, doing other things, we have been mindful of our activities, our mind, sorry, our body. Then also our feelings. Do we have pleasant feelings? Do we have unpleasant feelings? Or are feelings neutral? And the mind and the state of mind and the activities of the mind, we be aware of this. Let's say, for instance, you're watering the garden. You can focus on the watering, point, point the direction. You want to, to uh, water your veggies, then obviously you need to know where the veggies are, and then you peacefully, you water those veggies. Or if you're engaging in a discussion with others or some sort of act, physical activity with others, then you do the same. Continually be mindful, aware and conscientious. Once again, I'll mention that this way we also are a very good influence on others around us. Even people that are very nervous or angry type people or greedy, they, they tend to calm down a little bit. I'll share a little story that just come to my mind now um, from when I first started teaching late 98, I actually um, taught from a couple of books initially. And one of these books had little Buddhist stories in it. And there was a story of a Zen master, I think actually in China. So I probably should say Chan master. Um, just to let you know about that, um, the initial word or words in, the, in Sanskrit is dhyana, which means mental absorption. And it is expressed in Pali as Janna. When Buddhism made its way over the mountains into China, it became known as Channa with an accent, the Chinese accent, and eventually shortened to Chan, which then, of course, when it uh, moved to Korea, it became Sion, and then to Japan, it became Zen. But the initial word is Dhyana or Janna, depending on what, uh, what, what tradition you're following or practicing. Just a little bit of um, information there. So 
when Buddhism, um, you know, after some time, I can't remember the dates of this time or the name of the master, but this master was very kind um, and a brilliant master. And he was going to go away to another temple for a while. So he asked one of his, oh, by the way, the master loved orchids, flower, and used to have them as part of his, you know, mindfulness practice. And, and also to help his students as well. So he asked one of the young monks to look after, for the two weeks he was away, to look after the orchids. And so the, the monk, the young monk, took it very, very seriously to please his master. And every day at the right time, he would water and do, do whatever else that was necessary to the plants in the pots. Anyway, one, one of the days towards pretty close to when the master was coming back, he was so focused on watering exactly the right spot of the, of the orchids or in the pots that he wasn't paying attention to his elbows and he knocked one of the pots and then it created a chain reaction like dominoes and all of the orchids fell on the floor all of the pots smashed, no way he could salvage them. And he, for, for a couple of days, he was so worried, he couldn't sleep, he was so worried that the master would be angry. Anyway, the master uh, came back and the young student went to him and apologized, you know, got on his knees and said, I'm really sorry, master, but this is what happened. And he explained what happened. And I'm worried that you are angry. I don't want to make my master angry. And so the master said, oh, my child, I don't grow orchids to be angry. I grow them as part of the mindfulness practice and to help others practice mindfulness as well. Have no worries, no problem. We can get more orchids. But he said, what you didn't do is you weren't mindful and aware of your surroundings, that's all. You did very well in watering the orchids but you weren't paying attention to what was around you. <clears throat> and therefore you couldn't, um, you couldn't do it safely. So hopefully you like that story. And I don't know why I remembered it right now, but I think it's probably a, a good point. Now I've, I've written down a few notes just to, um, just to let you be, make sure I don't forget anything. Remember the mind, the mind has it's, it's mind or consciousness. What it is, it's, it's, you can call it conscious continuum. Moment to moment to moment to moment. Each thought leading to another thought. Without the previous thoughts, you wouldn't have the thought arising right now. Without this thought, it wouldn't give rise to the next thought. Just to, be, just to give you some other ideas of how the mind kind of works. We can't go into detail right now, of course. Um, what else is there? So the activities of the mind, just don't cling to them. But also at the same time, if the activities of the mind are unwholesome or harmful for yourself, then release them, eradicate them. You can see how the eightfold path is known as folding. Each aspect of it folds into the other aspects. Um, the mind is kind of like a river. It's an interesting one because you think about a river. If you're standing on the banks of a river going down a mountain, it looks like, oh, I'm standing at the same spot, the same river. But actually, as the water passes you, it's different water, isn't it? So it's actually a different river with the similar characteristics. Same with the mind, a little bit like that. I remember actually one time, I just share a little story with you, I digress slightly, but um, uh, one of the first times that I spoke uh, on behalf of my master, it was actually at the University of California in Irvine. And uh, it was off curriculum and they were running uh, courses uh, of forums. And this was an interfaith forum. Um, of which I was quite um, straightforward. I won't bore you with the details, apart from letting you know that it was about inter-religious inter marriages, of which some of the other guys, they were against it. 
And I pointed out that, you know, actually all of the religions uh, lead to love and care and, um, you know, it shouldn't, shouldn't be too much of a problem if people from different traditions uh, fell in love with each other. Um, you know, they're still human beings. We're all human beings. And anyway, I thought I was a bit forceful and apologised to my master um, afterwards. And he used the, the example of a river in a different way this time. He said, no, no, no problem. He said, it's not a problem. You were just like flowing river. <laughs> and what he, um, what he meant there was uh, that I didn't get off, blown off course because the, some of them really didn't like what I was saying. So, um, but I didn't let that stop, stop me. Just like a river always finds a way around the obstacles. So I just thought I'd share that with you. And that actually gave me a lot of confidence to speak, speak in public more, um, especially about the Dharma. So next week, we're going to talk about right concentration. Um, so I'll introduce that a little bit now. Um, remember that uh, mind.